Hey, what's up game devs? In this video, I'm just gonna show you how to do some procedural generation for level building. We'll look at some basic random generation and then add in Perlin noise, talk a little bit about random numbers and how these things are all repeatable. So if you have the same settings, you can make the exact same level, kind of like you'd see in a Minecraft or any other game that has a seed value, we'll, we'll use a seed. And I'll show you how you can swap out the prefabs and care, or the models so you can use them for whatever you want. This works at edit time and at runtime. I actually built this for the online battler that we run every Friday where we do a giveaway during the game dev show. By the way, if you don't come check out the show, make sure you subscribe and come join. We just talk about random game dev topics throughout the week. And this is something that came up there and kind of inspired me. So here you see, I've got a bunch of characters running around on a kind of ugly looking level. I can randomize the level just by adjusting the seed and the tiles are defined right here in this tile prefabs. And these actually come from a cube pack on the asset store. I'll link that down in the description so you can check it out if you want to use this, but it'll work with anything that's one meter by one meter, at least right now. You could, of course, resize that. Now, let's check out some of the cooler features before we dive into um, why or how it all works. So first, here's a tile height where I can adjust the height of different tiles. So that adjusts the ground dried up to 0.5 high. I could set the grass up to be like one meter high, and you can see that it's all happening randomly or live while I'm doing this. So I, it generates and all of these these values adjust on the fly. I can also just hit this button though, and this is where it's gonna get nice and pretty and add in some Perlin noise. Let's, let's zero these out for just a moment. You can see what it looks like with the noise with them all, whoops, at zero, not at 10. There we go, all flat. So here's the noise enabled and I've got this scale value. And if I turn this scale value down a bit, get down to these lower values, it's gonna start to look more like you would expect to see in a normal level. I've got a width here that I can adjust and notice that it kind of scales up with that and just scrolls. I've got my height. When I adjust the height, it's gonna kind of changed a little bit more, but it bounces up and down. But if I just wanted to scroll it, I've also got these horizontal and vertical scrolls. So if I find like an area that I like, I want it just like that, I can figure out exactly what these settings are, save them off. And I, I almost considered writing a little script or a little method that would save them off into a serialized object or a scriptable object that I could reload on the fly. But you just need to keep, keep this data and you can regenerate this level. So let's just see that in action real quick before we dive in a little bit further. So I changed my seed from 10 or negative 10 to zero. And if I change it to one, you see it goes to that, go back to zero, one, zero, one, zero. This number here is going to determine what our terrain should look like. Okay, let's look at the code. I think that's enough demoing. I'm gonna stop playing and real quickly before we go in, let's look at the object here. So I've got this terrain generator object and this is the entire thing responsible for my terrain. All the rest of the stuff is just for the game, for the characters moving around. The terrain is all in this one little script. If I expand it out, you see that all of those cubes are just children here. They're just popping up as objects there. Works perfectly fine on my system and we could optimize this later if we needed to. But the code for it is all here. Let's open it up now. Our terrain generator has a couple settings. First, there's this common settings area where we have that width and height. So I can adjust how wide it is, how tall it is, and figure out what level size I want. I've got a value here for the last seed, and this is used in on validate so that I can randomly regenerate it. It's marked as read only. This is an Odin inspector attribute that just makes it so that it shows up in the inspector, but can't be modified. You don't necessarily need that. If you don't have Odin, just remove the read only field. It's just there so that I would know not to go modify it. And and then we have the seed value. This is the one that's used for our random number generation. We're gonna take a look at that before we dive into the Perlin settings. So let's scroll down just a little bit into our on validate method. First here on line 34, I just checked to make sure that my tile height array matches the length of my tile prefabs. And let's go back and just take a real quick look because it's not anything complicated. That's just this array right here. I want it to be the same size here just so that I can adjust these values and whoops, give them you know, a value of one or whatever to pop them up. And really I'm using values like 0.25 to just give them a nice little height increase. And it of course only looks good when I enable the Perlin options and turn the scale down. So go like that and it looks, looks quite a bit better. Let's go back in though and see the rest of this. 
open up our terrain generator. So we resize that array just so that it matches because we're going to use it later. And then on line 37, we check to see if our seed has changed. So if the seed does not match the last seed or we've changed our width or height, then we're going to regenerate the terrain. We're going to we'll first we'll cache the seed and then we'll call generate terrain. Let's look at generate terrain next. It's right down here and it's actually going to call in to destroy existing terrain. So we'll look at it though. We'll go to generate terrain. First thing it does is call into that destroy existing terrain. So if I go up here, you see that first I checked to make sure that we have some terrain tiles. This is a list where we're storing all the terrain tiles. We get all of the terrain tiles that have a mesh renderer and then just destroy them. Again, easy to optimize, but I wanted to make sure that this is simple because this is not really part of the random generation. This is just part of the instantiating, keeping the objects around, and you can decide how you want to do that. You can optimize that later with something else, or you can just pop in game objects like I've done here. Next, we've got a map method that's used down below. We'll take a look at that once we use it. And then back to our generate terrain. In generate terrain, after we destroy the existing terrain, this is probably the biggest part and the biggest secret thing that you need to make sure to pay attention to. On line 69, we initialize the random method or the random generator here by calling init state. We give it a seed value, and that's gonna make it so that every time we generate this, because we're calling this same method with the same seed, value as long as we don't change other values like our width or height then the method is going to give us the same random number well no matter what it's going to give us the same random numbers in the same order so the randomization is going to be the same so the seed allows us to control that and if you're wondering how that works you never really looked into random stuff before it's important to note that random numbers on computers are not actually random they're pseudo random they're supposed to look and feel random but it's actually there's a mathematical formula that it's running to figure out what the next number should be. It's given a seed and then it calculates that out, out from that. And there are different random number generators that you can use. The Unity Engine one is pretty good. Um, the thing that makes it feel random when you're playing games though is that that seed is normally randomized throughout the game. It's randomized based off of things like your CPU clock at the time that it actually kicked off and started. So that makes it feel random enough that you can't really tell the difference. So that's why it's repeatable though, because if we give it the same seed, it's gonna run through that same method and we're gonna get the same values every time. Let's look at what it does. First, we do a loop and we're looping through the width and the height here. And on line 73 and 74, they're actually not tabbed in, kind of in, intentionally, just because it's very obvious, or it might, might not be very obvious, but I wanna make sure that it's very obvious. That we're doing a loop here for each X one, and then we're doing a sub loop for each Z. These could be in curly braces. Maybe it would make it more obvious to people, but this is just the way that I, I've written it and I'm kind of used to it. So we loop through all the X's from negative width. So if we had a width of eight, we go negative eight to positive eight. If we do height, we do you know, negative whatever 12 to positive 12. And then first thing I do on line 76 is just choose a random tile. You might think, oh, okay, that's pretty simple, right? So we just go random range from zero to the number of tiles that we have. Um, we have a terrain tile that gets cached here. You'll see that's just because we're, um, we're determining it down here at the end. In fact, I don't know why I have that there. I'm going to move that. I think that was part of a, a refactor. There we go. Let's clean it up and make it easier. Next, we have a check to see if we're going to use the Perlin generation options. If we are, then what we do is, well, let's just go through it because it's not very complicated. We figure out the X and Z coordinates on the map. We give it a random offset, and this random offset is right here. That's the random generation that we're using. And then we add in the horizontal and vertical scroll. So this allows us to scroll left and right. So we're getting a coordinate that we want to use, and then we divide it by the width times the scale and the height times the scale. And the scale is that slider number that allows us to adjust the noise value. You can see that the areas get bigger as the scale goes down and smaller as the scale goes up. So let's take a look at the next part. On line 82, we get a value back from the math F Perlin noise. And this was one where we give it an X and a Z coordinate or an X and a Y, but here we're X and Z because we're on 3D. And we're gonna get back a value between zero and one. And it's gonna be a, ideally a nice kind of 
um, smooth transitional number be between the coordinates. So we get that smooth transition where you get hills and ramps and stuff that go up and down. Um, it, oh, it's not ideal. It's going to be that. And we have to take that Y value and then convert it into something that we can use to get a terrain index. So I'm just using a simple map method here. And I thought about pulling this in, but it's just a very common thing. If you search for map a float to you know another range of numbers, this is the kind of method that you get where you give it your value, you give it your original minimum and maximum and your ma target minimum and maximum. In fact, I thought there was a, a map method built into Unity, but maybe maybe there is and I'm just forgetting about it now. So we use that map method to figure out what terrain index we want to use. So that's going to go from zero to one is going to give us a tile from our list of tiles. We have up four tiles, so it's going to give us value one to four. And then we create, get the tile right here on line 87. So we just cache it from the train tile prefabs. Go look at my train tile prefabs. That's just this list of prefabs. And if I want to go add in another prefab, I can do that. I can do that even uh, at runtime if I wanted to. Let's, let's do it right now, in fact. Let's see, I'll just go select my cube grass and I'm gonna take cube ground dried, drop it on there and look at that, I've got a new one. Let's go find snow or something that, that's even more obvious. So go drop in some snow. Bam, now you can see I've got, got snow appearing. And if I want to drag this down here, I can make it show up as, as the more prominent one. I can adjust, um, oh, there's my border height. We'll just look at that next. Uh, the scale again does that, the scaling part that I was just showing. And let's go back to the code one more time. A couple more things that we need to take a peek at. So we get the train index either from the Perlin value or just randomly. And again, if we do random without the Perlin, it looks kind of like this. Not ideal for most games, but you might want to go with something like that, I guess. So there could be some scenarios. And then we continue on and we check to see if we're a border tile. So if we're a border tile, and there's actually an optimization to, to shrink this down even more, but we just check to see if the X value is all the way on the edge or the Z value is all the way on the edge, either all the way at the minimum or maximum height or width. If so, then I use a terrain border prefab and that's why I've got this nice little blue around the edge and you could change this to something like a wood or a lava or anything else. So if I want to do lava, I can do that. And then I've last thing we've got is a height for these options. So I've got that border height that I can drag up and down. And then I've got these other tile heights. You've kind of seen the tile heights. If I adjust them, they go up and down. Let's go look at that part. Go down here to the bottom. If we're a border, we first set our train tile to be that border one. And then on line 92, we instantiate the tile at the position that we wanted. We add it to our list of tiles. And then if we're a border, we move up by the border height. Otherwise we move up by the tile height. Now we could even have like the first tile be the border tile or something like that, but I wanted to make it a little bit more explicit. And that's again, really all you need for some basic random generation with Perl and noise. You can do some, some neat levels. You can again, scroll left and right across your level. You could do this at runtime dynamically. So I mean, you could be generating these as you wanted to go along and you can do lots more stuff with procedural generation. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, um, like subscribe and drop a comment below and maybe I'll do some more videos on how you can add in other features, add in forests and rivers and all that kind of stuff. But I feel like this is probably a good starting point and hopefully simple enough for everybody to understand. If you want the code, I'll make sure that it's available for download um, down in the description and the packs that I'm using, the cube pack, I'll, I'll link that down there as well, as, along with Odin Inspector, which is giving me this nice preview here. I, I didn't mention the way the reason that this looks so pretty and has these uh, little drop downs and stuff and is rearrangeable like that is because I'm using Odin Inspector. Anyway, thanks again for watching. Hopefully this was helpful. If you want to come join the giveaway battles, make sure that you come join us on Fridays, 9 a.m. Pacific is typically the time. And uh, if you subscribe and hit the alert button, you'll get alerts when that happens. Also, if you're interested in multiplayer game development, make sure you check out the Multiplayer Mastery course. We're still having live calls on Mondays and Thursdays, and we're getting into NPC development and synchronizing animation. So NPCs where you can have them run around, fight each other, fight you, cast spells, and they work just like player characters. So it's a lot of fun. Um, I have some really interesting discussions and people are building some really cool stuff in there. Anyway, thanks again. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.